Okay, so once again, welcome everyone to tonight's Match Official PD webinar series. We will be looking at refereeing the Scrum. Today's webinar will be done a little bit differently than we have in the past. I have a guest presenter with me, Mr. Christopher Asmus from BC Rugby, who was kind enough to help with some of the content, and he will be delivering uh, parts of this webinar as we go through. So just a reminder for those of you who have not used the GoToWebinar control panel, on your panel, there will be um, a questions box where you can type in a couple of questions. We will be happy to take some either throughout or at the end of particular modules and such. Um, but uh, yeah, feel free to fire away there. Uh, what we'll do is I'll kick things off for the first couple of slides and then Chris will chip in with um, some of the more pertinent content with regards to refereeing the Scrum. And then I will finish us off uh, when we look at um, uh, notes for our coaches and match officials, as well as some of the safety bits we need to be reminded of, as always. So, without further ado, Chris, we can move on to the next slide. So, today, what we're going to try and take a look at is a few different things. By the end of the webinar, hopefully, we'll all have a better understanding of the role of the referee at Scrum Setup in order to ensure safe and stable scrums. So, particular content around how we help ourselves set ourselves up for success, but it's not just for us, it's also for the players. So they'll get a good understanding of that as well. We'll also look to learn to identify legal dominance and how do we use that information to facilitate a successful end to the scrum, whether that be through the ball out or through uh, having to sanction appropriately. And finally, we're going to learn to identify and provide some remedies for issues that can arise out of uh, unstable scrums. So what causes unstable scrums and how do we go about trying to solve some of those issues? All right, so uh, next one there, Chris. We're going to take a gander at um, how this content relates to the Rugby Canada referee profile. So uh, when we take a look at the profile, on the right, uh, which is also available on the Rugby Canada website, there's a few things that I want us to, to take note of. The first is, next point, that uh, although the scrum can be regarded as a very technical aspect of the game, um, the reality is there's a lot of context within the game that goes into how we want to both manage and officiate scrum time. It's an area of the game that although referees uh, do need to do a better job of across the board of being more technically aware. Um, we also need to have an understanding of uh, how, to, how do we look to simplify refereeing the scrum to make sure that our management progressions are, are consistent and that we're able to get players to buy into some of the things we need to see at scrum time regardless of the level we're refereeing. Um, that being said, there's obviously a few key points out of the referee profile that we will um, examine throughout this presentation. So the first will be from a technical perspective, looking at potty, positive body position at the scrum. So seeing those positive pushing positions by players at scrum time. From a tactical perspective, we'll be looking at a couple of things. One is rewarding legal dominance at the scrum. And the second is a contextual judgment or what the game needs. Decisions from a contextual perspective definitely do need to, to keep the context of the game in, in mind. And then finally, from a game management perspective, a few different pieces, more, some more than others, but obviously our clear communication and our progression of sanctions, those two kind of go hand in hand when we look at how do we use either the reset or uh, penalties or free kicks or just communication at downtime or in between scrums to help outline our standards. And then, of course, our zero tolerance for foul play. And although foul play isn't specifically listed under, uh, uh, sorry, infringements of the scrum aren't specifically listed under foul play, um, we do want to ensure that the safety of all the players um, is of top of mind when we go through um, our, our management of the scrum. So that's why I, I included that piece in there. So what I'll do now is hand it over to Chris. Chris is going to be presenting the majority of the content for this section. I will help facilitate some questions as we go through, um, and then uh, I will wrap things up again afterwards. So thanks, Chris, for getting us started here, and then um, I'll go over to you. Great. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, hi, everyone. So just, just touching on that point on, 
on safety. You know, we talked about it from a foul play point of view, but also just from a, a stability point of view. Uh, that's that's really paramount and, and something we have to keep in mind um, throughout not only this presentation but throughout our uh, our management of each phase, each step of the process um, at the set scrum. So uh, looking at setup, uh, it's a term that's it's kind of a buzzword nowadays, but uh, effectively it, it means everything that we do um, from when we blow the whistle to uh, when we get the ball uh, into the scrum. Bear with me, have a second here. All right. Um, so just looking at it, it starts before the game, really. Um, are we making sure that we're we're having the the conversations we need to have with uh, you know depending on what age level or, or what context we're refereeing in? Um, are we ensuring that we have suitably trained front row to begin with? Um, and of course, for for U19 and below. Uh, the law requires us to to ensure that there are suitably trained uh, locks as well, so otherwise known as our tight five. So, uh, you know, are we going to have a contested scrum to begin with? And if we have doubts around this point, um, especially in, in an age grade setting, uh, we're probably not going to have a contested scrum. Uh, and more on that just uh, at, at the World Rugby Laws site. Um, especially when we talk about squad size and how many suitably trained front rowers we need um, in, the, in that in that regard as well. Um, the setup process is is you know if we've if we've established that we you know we're okay to have a push and we have suitably trained front row or or tight five uh, in the U19 context. Um, you know what what do we have to address in our setup process? So establishing clear expectations for what needs to happen from a player point of view um, at crouch, at bind and, and at set and, and after set as well. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily be overly prescriptive, uh, especially when we're, when we're refereeing some of the senior competitions, but at the same time, it's a good opportunity um, before the game just to, just to keep the front row players in the know from what you expect from them and also what they can expect from you um, during the setup process, because this is this is mainly where where the referee has their their most involvement is through that that setup process, and we'll we'll go through uh, just what that looks like in a little bit. And and finally, having stability expectations. Often we have we have teams that you know fancy their scrums and, and like to have a push, so making sure that they understand that the message is clear that if they want a reward, whether it be a penalty kick or a turnover or or to apply pressure um, legally to the opposition, that the expectation is that they demonstrate um, a go forward or, or a straight push um, in order to get that reward. Chris, sorry, if you could just pop back to the previous slide for one sec. I just want to reiterate to people with regards to suitably trained front row to make sure that they're up to speed with their provincial rules and regulations around player numbers, especially as it pertains to substitutions. So although we have a minimum number of front row players that must be present in certain variations and such, um, senior versus U19, et cetera, um, we may have different allowances for substitutions depending on um, your provincial rules and regs. So just make sure you're up to speed with with that. Yeah, 100%. And uh, I, I mean, from a BC Rugby point of view, uh, you know, just Google BC Rugby rules of competition and, and uh, it's got all of the, um, you know, competition or league specific regulations around substitutions and, fr and front row players. Um, particularly to the to the men's and women's premier leagues, which actually require um, teams to have a suitably trained front row uh, in order to play the game to begin with. Um, but at any rate, that's uh, rules of competition stuff. And again, when just something on that, Nathan, very interesting conversation came up last week involving um, a couple of school size. Uh, there, uh, you know, there was a disagreement about you know whether or not the, the school the, the school side needed to have a suitably trained front row etc and they actually put on a little bit of pressure to the referee and one coach was saying oh we don't need to have a front row the other coach was saying well it's a it's a default or a forfeit um th this is all rules of competition stuff and, and as the referee on the day um you're not going to compromise or jeopardize the safety of the players because of a competitions issue um if the coaches aren't happy um, again, and, and the rules aren't clear, um, you know, play the game with uncontested scrums and then allow the competitions committee in your jurisdiction to, to sort it out. Um, we don't want to be the people that are allowing 
non suitably trained front row players to play um, at all, but especially um, not for the sake of, of, of competition rules. Again, law, competition rules are great, but laws of the game always um, supersede them. And ultimately that's um, with stability and safety in mind. So uh, when we get into the game, so we've blown the whistle, we've had a knock on forward pass, uh, unplayable, et cetera. Um, we're getting set up for our scrum. So just this is this is the time where we need to switch on as referees. So before we, we even engage the scrum or we call set, there's a, a, a bunch of work that needs to be done. And this is active work um, for referees. Um, you know, and and as well as players, but referees need to be involved in this process and and be looking for a series of things um, to happen in order to have success, um, which is obviously stability and safety throughout throughout the process. So alignment of front row players. Obviously, we want players moving to the left so that they can be able to get their head, um, shoulders, spine, and hips and feet in the right spot uh, in order to be successful. So that starts before we even call crouch. Um, the binding of front row players. So again, before crouch and after bind, this is the binding between, you know, hooker and prop um, to make sure that they're in a strong, comfortable position uh, before we even call crouch. And ultimately, after we call bind, we're making sure that those binds between teammates are still strong and comfortable and that um, binds between opponents, ergo uh, between props, are, are nice and high and, and strong. And of course, stability of the entire scrum at each phase. So again, even before we call crouch, you know, is does the second row look stable? Um, are the back rows on the scrum? Um, it's it's an ingredient we often forget uh, to include in our process. But again, um, all eight players should be involved in this in this setup um, of the scrum, and 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 they should all be in a strong, comfortable position uh, before we call crouch. Um, and again, just uh, taking this one step further at the setup, um, you know, really good referees, not only do they get their alignment, binding and stability right, but if they see issues that may compromise any of these three components, they can identify and provide a simple and concise remedy, um, again, to, to deal with any stability issues at the setup. Because again, this is, this is, as referees, the better we get at setup, um the easier it will be to uh to be able to actually referee the thing so just look at we'll just look at a little bit of a clip of what that looks like in terms of you know making sure our alignment of our front row players is accurate and we are in a position to succeed Nathan, were you able to see that? Yep, we're good to go. Perfect. All right. So obviously we've blown the whistle. Front rows are coming together, and we'll just run up. I know it's a bit uh, choppy at parts. So we'll just play this all the way through, and then I'm going to stop it at key points where I just want to highlight what the referee is actually doing. So the work that the referee does, as we suggested, starts when they when they blow the whistle. Um, we not only make a mark on the ground, but what I what I would encourage referees to do is actually to leave their foot where the mark is and actually look at where the hookers line themselves up. So as we look, um, the referee is actually right in there, making sure that the hookers have gone left. As soon as he's satisfied with where the hookers have aligned, um, he moves into a position where Again, here we can see him looking at the second rows and making sure they're in a comfortable position. Um, and obviously, he's had an, he has had an eye on making sure that loose head shoulder is out. Everyone's in a, a strong, comfortable position even before we call um, crouch. So we get that alignment right. We get these binds strong. And at that stage, he's even having a look at his back lines because all the all the work here is done. But you notice he, he's just as he's called crouch here, everyone's on the scrum. Six, seven, and eight are all in the scrum. Six, seven, and eight are all on the scrum. Um, second rows are ready to go. At bind, 
he has another look. He doesn't move out yet and make sure that the the scrum is able to restabilize after the binds happen and the adjustments of the feet happen. And of course, there's a moment of stability as the ball goes in. So just looking at what that scrum setup looks like, number one is alignment. And often if we if we do the work to get there and actually make sure and have a look that the hookers have gone left and everyone's got a good spot to put their head in, uh, we'll have a higher chance of success because players will actually have a place to go to be able to stay square as opposed to having to readjust and uh, and manipulate their body angles to be able to fit into a hole that's really not there. Just going to catch up here, sorry about that. So uh, just post engagement, after we get the ball in, uh, or after we've come together, rather, we have stability before the ball comes in. And what that looks like is the scrum is not changing direction, uh, nor is it moving uh, before the throw-in can happen. Um, we're looking for a straight push. So obviously, if teams are, are looking to uh, to get a bit of a drive on, especially the team not putting in the ball, um, we're looking for you know them going forward before the scrum um starts to change direction or goes up or down and um, and then we're looking for our binds to be maintained so they um, players often adjust their binds that's totally okay as long as they say stay, stay high um away from the shoulder and the arm um and again particularly the throw-in tight head prop um, having his bind not on the arm of the non-throw-in loose head prop. And of course, the non-throw-in loose head prop, um, a good uh, thing to be aware of is their left elbow not pointing towards the ground. And of course, our, our extra ingredient, um, you know, when the ball's emerging, are we aware of space um, that, that teams are required in, in order to and get the ball back in play, which ultimately is the is the whole point of a scrum. So six, seven, and eight shoulders are on the scrum, um, half back or scrum half clearly behind the ball with both feet, and non-participating players, um, otherwise known as backline players, at five meters back. So we're just going to look at a, a video from start to finish about what we're doing actively as referees and what we're watching for um, through the pre-engagement and post-engagement um, of, of the scrum setup. Oh, far to move. And again, it's after we get that engagement happening, the best time to reset the scrum or to not let it to continue uh, is if you see an issue straight away. So here um, we've called bind. And right away, we talked about that classic binding issue of tight head prop, especially the put in tight end prop, um, binding on the arm of the non put in uh, loose head prop. And obviously that doesn't allow the non put in loose head prop to have uh, a strong bind so that he can get his chest in the right position. So here we see the elbow pointing towards the floor. Um, so we have two binding issues here and it results in problem with stability and the scrum actually turns before the ball is put in. So good opportunity to reset. And we'll look at specifics of providing remedies later, but what we want to look for from start to finish again is making sure our alignment is good, our binds for each team are strong and comfortable. As we call bind, we're looking for that main maintenance of a strong comfortable position so the players will be adjusting their legs. Often you'll see the scrum like it is now, it will come up. As you call bind, you wait for it to come down and then the players set in a strong, comfortable position. So even though the scrum eventually goes down, 
Um, the scrum went forward initially, restabilized, and eventually the players lose their footing for could have been the ground, it could have been uh, fatigue, but ultimately um, the, the correct outcome happens is the team that went forward initially, which is the put-in team in this case, is able to win a uh, good possession. And obviously the defense has an opportunity to defend legally, um, having started with uh, their shoulders on the scrum. So again, to recap, um, just on that setup piece, we're looking for alignment of our front rows to be left and to allow players to get their heads, shoulders, spines, hips, and feet in the right positions. We're looking for strong and comfortable binding throughout the process. So that starts before crouch. And again, we check in again after bind to make sure that binds between teammates and opponents are strong and comfortable. And that we have stability of the entire scrum at each phase. So again, if they're strong and comfortable, we let things carry on. If they're not strong and comfortable, we blow the whistle and we remedy the clear issue that's there. Uh, once the ball, the scrum, excuse me, once the scrum comes together, we have the moment of stability, so so the ball will come in. Obviously, now we we have the nine or the halfback putting the ball in without a referee signal. Um, so at lower levels of the game, what I would strongly suggest especially in the early stages is maybe stay on on that put inside because often nines won't be smart enough to not put the ball into a scrum that's moving um but again as the game evolves and the scrum stability improves you don't have to worry about being on that throw inside so much and, and you can move to the side where you feel um will put you in a position to see uh, what you need to see or go where where you believe uh, a threat to stability might exist um, and obviously we're looking for a straight push that initial go forward this doesn't mean going forward two or three meters every time it's just going forward that one step or two steps to allow the team to get a good strike on the ball um, or to put pressure on the on the striking team if they're not putting the ball in and again looking for our binds to stay high as close to the spine as possible and um, there, there's a lot of people who use the term long bind um, players can buy long or short as long as they're on the back um, or the side of their opponent and not on the arm um, or on the shorts is as we see in some cases with loose head props binding super long and again aware of that space when the ball's emerging so part of the scrum is actually getting the ball back in place so once the ball is is at the back of the scrum we're aware of the non put in and the put in for that matter um six seven and eight uh the loose forwards shoulders are on the scrum the halfbacks clearly behind the ball with two feet um and the non-participating players are maintaining that five meter space so before we get into legal dominance, Nathan, is there anything else you wanted to, to touch base on? Nope, I think that's great. I think uh, like we've reiterated, it's about setting ourselves up and the players up to be successful when they get into scrum. If we're able to be consistent in how we apply our setup, I think it'll lead to a lot more success. So um, I know you'll get into what does that look like now when we do have success. So let's, let's take a gander. Very cool. Um, so yeah, just talking about what that does look like when we have go forward or legal dominance. So um, obviously scrum is a pushing contest. So when people say, oh, what does legal dominance look like in a scrum? Effectively, it's a team winning a pushing contest, otherwise known as go forward. Um, so what does that look like? The throw in tight end prop stays straight and does not go backwards. So ultimately, if the tight head prop, even if he doesn't go forward, um a, a big distance uh that scrum can still be successful as long as he does not go backwards he or she i should say so um the role of the tight head prop is pivotal um and if we have um legal dominance that means we're seeing the tight head prop go forward um or at the very least not go backwards um or back and in towards their own hooker the non-throw in loose head prop obviously starts straight and gets under the tight head prop. And, and again, that's indicated by them moving forward, by their feet moving forward, followed by their body. 
And what does that look like from a big picture point of view? All eight forwards go forward before the scrum turns or collapses. So again, scrums do turn, scrums collapse. It, it, doesn't, not it doesn't necessarily mean that an infringement has happened or you, you necessarily need to blow the whistle. But again, what is legal dominance? Do all eight forwards go forward um, a, a visible distance? And that distance could be you know, a, a, a number of centimeters really, but do they go forward a clear distance before the scrum starts to turn or collapses? So again, what does that look like? Um, from a legal dominance point of view, let's have a quick look. So again, even though that scrum eventually collapses, we can see that the red team is able to effectively push the blue team off the ball and we don't even need to get involved as a referee. Sometimes the best reward of legal dominance is allowing play to continue and not blowing our whistle. So we see here, there's no clear setup issues. Red is in a, the tight end is in a strong, comfortable position. Um, we see that there's some weakness with the loose head prop setup, but again, we don't need to stop anything because there's nothing illegal about what's going on, but we start to see that this prop here might be in trouble. So we're keeping our eye closely on this battle here. Red goes forward with all eight forwards a visible distance. Blue is under pressure, unable to hook the ball, and the ball comes back to the red team, despite the fact that the red prop eventually loses his feet. But they go forward a visible distance by about one and a half meters, enough to win the ball. And we're able to play on. And that last ingredient, uh, you can see the referees really trying to manage these players back as far as possible, because knowing that scrum went down, uh, he knows the number eight might be under a bit of pressure. So keeping six, seven, and eight as close to the scrums as possible and the nine behind the ball allows not only the turnover to happen, but the ball to be played away so that both teams can compete at the next phase. So sometimes playing on with the turnover is a reward of legal dominance. In other cases, scrums are not dominant enough to turn over the ball, but they're dominant enough to at least put some pressure um, on the team in possession. So again, start to finish. Scrum setup is good. There's a moment of stability. The ball goes in. And we initially see that the, they get a very quick hook on the ball, that is the white team does here. Um, and we start to see the tight head under a bit of pressure, turning back towards his own hooker. And by the time the ball ends up at the back, so here's the ball right underneath the eight's feet, um, the tight heads turn quite a bit. So effectively, we're waiting to see if this white team can play the ball immediately. If they fail to do so and the ball gets stuck in the scrum, we have an easy decision here, um, which is the white tight head prop not pushing straight as he's going backwards under pressure. But we see that the ball is immediately playable and actually white do a good job um, of dealing with the pressure legally and, and getting the ball out. But at the same time, we're, we're not necessarily um, penalizing the dominance here of, of the blue team because look what they've been able to achieve. All of the white forwards are stuck ahead of the ball. The blue forwards are now able to come out of the scrum and we have a massive mismatch situation with seven in a bad position. Um, we have 10 and we have 12 supporting um, against number eight and three, four support players. So again, blue probably ends up winning this situation even though we didn't blow the whistle. So again, sometimes a, a reward of legal dominance is allowing the team that won the ball to play under pressure. So again, balls one at the back, no infringement yet. As we carry on, we have the tight head who stands up under pressure and goes in. But again, as soon as we blow our, put our whistle to our lips, we can play. There's absolutely no danger to anyone here. No one was disadvantaged. We have white 
with possession under pressure, which is probably what is deserved because blue is going forward at the scrum and able to get seven and eight out. Eight out. With possession. Anything else to add here, Nathan? No, the only thing I want to say is um, it's really good patience by the referee. And I think if we take a similar approach as we try and espouse at the breakdown at times, letting the game breathe a bit and seeing what happens. Um, if the ball doesn't come out, it's an easy decision for the referee, but give it, give the game some time to let it dictate itself in a sense, right? I thought he did really well here. 100% agree on that point, Nathan. <clears throat> Excuse me. And finally, uh, scrum legal dominance can often be achieved um, through a penalty kick. So, and this is this is really when we feel that the team who's dominant does not gain the reward they deserve. So, in the, in the previous clip, we saw the blue team able to apply pressure and able to actually gain an advantage at the next phase, um, which is a sufficient reward. We saw the very first scrum, the, the team that applied legal dominance was able to win a turnover, so that's a sufficient reward. And in this situation, we see that the black team putting it in um, is going to be under some pressure. So let's play this from start to finish. So again, it ends up in a penalty kick against the black team. So the black team are struggling to hold on here. We see initially that they try um, to attack the tight head uh, and get a cheap um, you know, channel one ball with a slightly skewed put in. They're unable to win and actually number eight has to, for lack of a better term, hit the beach, reach into the scrum and make sure that the ball doesn't come back to the white team who are going forward uh, a fair distance. So the referee waits expects that white deserves the ball here white doesn't come up with the ball and the decision is available to the referee to penalize the tight head prop here for coming up under pressure so the tight head prop backs up and we see that the both the hooker and the tight head prop are no longer in a position to push And we have a clear penalty for not pushing straight or standing up if you prefer. So again, all three of these examples are examples of rewards for legal dominance. So as referees, we can penalize and reward the legal dominance by awarding a penalty to the dominant team, we, but we can also allow turnovers to happen um, if they're there. And we can also, um, allow a pressure to be applied on the non-dominant team um, provided we we don't think that a clear infringement uh, denied the dominant team uh, more of an advantage and again going back to what nathan said um the the contextual piece comes in to play because as referees we also want to be making sure that we reward uh, the clear and obvious and that we're not um giving one team the excuse to you know, deliberately wheel or collapse the scrum because they know that the other team's under pressure. So if we, if we give them rewards that are clear and obvious, we keep the scrum to being a pushing contest and the players will allow the referee to manage rather than if we don't apply the right sanctions, teams will start taking the law into their own hands, which um, is not really what we want at scrum time. Anything else, uh, Nathan, before I move on to uh, addressing uh, stability and providing remedies? providing remedies? Nope. No, I think we're good. Thanks. Very cool. So we looked at it from a positive point of view, what it looks like when the scrums are going well, what it looks like when stability is good enough at setup to get the ball in the scrum. But we've all had those days where we're actually not able to get the ball in the scrum at all because, you know, what, you know, on crouch or on, on bind or on set, there's a big issue and the scrum collapses before um, the halfback can actually introduce the ball. So um, let's start looking at, from a big picture point of view, um, what causes unstable scrums. So primarily body position. Um, pictures that we see often are the tight head prop being overextended. So the legs not in a strong position. Um, and often this is indicated by them falling straight on their face with their legs uh, behind them. Um, another picture that's common is loose head props, shoulders below their hips. So legs are not in a strong position, they're often too close, and then they end up with their chest and shoulders on the ground, um, otherwise known as a, a hinging motion. 
And again, that not driving straight piece, um, we'll see a loose head prop hips coming out and off the scrum. Um, or on, from a tight end point of view, you'll see them retreat in towards their own hooker to protect uh, not only themselves, but to take the space away from their opponent so that their opponent is no longer able to drive forward. Um, poor binds, and I, I say binds at the end uh, quite deliberately because mo mainly it's the body position of the, of the head shoulders, hips, spine, and feet that actually indicate um, whether a scrum is strong or weak. Binds um, with, with arms and chest become, becomes quite secondary. If we get these things right, the bind becomes less of a factor. And Or on the other hand, if we get these things right, then the bind becomes um, very clear if we need to deal with it. So again, the, the pictures that we're, we're looking out for from a negative point of view, um, loose head props, um, elbow down towards the floor, um, or tight head props uh, binding on, the, on their opposition's arm. Um, and again, uh, obviously we, we have some team issues if we see pushing or work, meaning foot, footwork before the ball's thrown in, um, you know, pre-engage, early push, early angles. Um, obviously there's some, these are some issues that, that can jeopardize stability, um, not only before the ball goes in, but after the ball goes in. So what does this look like? So from a tight head prop perspective, as we're looking at this player here, we see that initially he goes backwards and he's already starting to retreat towards his own hooker. And we see White is actually able to go forward here. Eventually, the loose head ends up going around the corner. Um, a lot of the time you'll see supporters of this black team here, um, you know, uh, trying to appeal for a penalty here against White for uh, for not pushing straight or quote unquote I hate the term uh, boring in, um, but anyway the as we can we can clearly see that Black goes backwards the tight end proper treats towards his own hooker leaving this loose head prop with nowhere to go so obviously this is a massive threat to stability because not only does the scrum turn it eventually um, stands up and no one's really in a position to to succeed um, so that's an example of the tight head prop in under pressure so often uh, one of the most common threats to stability another tight head pre uh, prop picture we'll see if we go too much the other way so the legs obviously too close right underneath the chest we start to see that there's going to be a problem. And now in order to adjust that poor position, the tight head prop ends up being overextended. And from this position, he's got two ways to go. He can go in and up or he can go down and out. He chooses to go in and up and actually ends up standing up straight away. So a good example of tight head prop uh, under pressure and in, in once again. Another picture we'll see is uh, a tight head prop overextended with their legs too far back. So we see here that indication of those straight legs. He's fighting to keep his shape. And then legs up the back, chest on the ground. Um, obviously, if we see this picture, we know that and if we decided not to penalize it, we have a simple remedy to put some pressure onto that tight head prop and remind him he's got to keep his feet underneath him and not um, behind him so that he's unable to support his own weight. So uh, before we jump to, um, apologies, get back to this file folder here. Before we jump to loose head prop pictures, is there anything you wanted to touch base on, Nathan? No, I think uh, when we get through some of the wrap up, we'll we'll look at um, um, just uh, the emphasis moving towards positive <laughs> images instead of negative images. But yeah, we're on the right page. So here we go. All right, silence is consent, no problem. Uh, so let's go through to some loose head prop pictures. So 
we'll run this through it for everyone again. This um, we see that the loose head prop on the left hand side of our, our screen here is having trouble dealing with the pressure that's coming through. Um, we see the legs very straight, the chest and, and elbow start to drop. And we see it as a very compromised position here. Um, both legs are very widespread, both legs are very straight, and he has nowhere to go but down onto his chest, um, causing a, a collapse on his side of the scrum. The loose head props angle, often another indication uh, or a threat to stability rather. So we see straight away as the scrum is set up, that left leg is straight and out towards um, the scrum half. Chest is down, elbows down. And as soon as the ball comes in, um, he actually ends up having to make a 90 degree turn onto the tight head prop. And a good indication here is that the tight head prop is actually able to maintain a pretty straight angle, um, despite the fact that the loose head is turned 90 degrees on him. And it actually allows uh, the black team to win the ball uh, when they potentially don't deserve it. At any rate, so those are the common pictures we'll see um, from a loose head prop and a tight head prop point of view. Um, threats to stability. There are some times where we do need to uh, reset the scrum and we do need to suggest or apply a remedy um, to allow the teams to make an adjustment uh, so that we can get better, better pictures at the scrum. So we'll just watch a sequence of scrums where we don't have a lot of success at the setup. So as we see here, we have reset number one. Uh, no clear infringement from from one side, rather, as we see that one side has engaged the scrum early, the other side hasn't stayed straight. We have a loose head prop elbow down and we have a tight head prop bind on arm. Um, both teams uh, don't have very good position at all in the second row or the back row, as we see this uh, hips uh, way above shoulders picture, which obviously is a big problem and no success. So we've reset it once, we've reset it a second time. And one of the tools you can do is obviously you've, you've moved the scrum once, you've given the, the, the props an opportunity by moving the scrum, you've showed them that you're gonna give them the benefit of the doubt that there might be a ground issue involved in stability. Clear, we have the same binding issues and then a collapse. Now that we've moved the scrum, so we've taken away a factor we can isolate. So we've we've dealt with our alignment binds of stability throughout all eight players. We've isolated the problem towards two players. And one of the solutions that's often uh, one of the first ones you can apply if you do see that the tight head prop is having trouble staying off the loose head's arm and the loose head prop is struggling to bind. Um, you can simply suggest that the tight head prop reaches higher up on the back and the loose head prop presents an easier target by having his shoulders above his hips so that there's somewhere where the tight head can bind that's easily accessible as opposed to trying to reach on, on a target that's moving down and underneath him. And often the loose head prop takes away the tight head space so that the tight head has to uh, put his arm in a less than comfortable position. So once we've provided that remedy, we need to stay on that side of the scrum and we need to make sure that although there are other factors that potentially contribute to unstable scrums, that we've provided a remedy and we've followed up on what we've said that we need to see. So we have an improvement. Um, we see that the loose head props elbow is up. The tight head has reached slightly higher on the back and we see that there's separation here. So no one's binding on each other's arms. The chest is up. And again, we have a slight improvement in stability, enough to get the ball in. 
and get the ball out. So we've allowed that side of the scrum, ergo that put in tight head prop to survive long enough to able to get the ball in, keep the scrum out, and then the uh, non put in loose head is able to push straight, get a little bit of go forward for a side. So the white team is actually able to push the blue team backward a little bit, and the blue team are able to come up with reasonable possession um, on a very difficult day um, that does have some, some footing issues that can make uh, pre-existing stability issues more problematic. So again, how do we deal with providing remedies when we have stability issues, particularly when we can't even get the ball in the scrum? Uh, we go back to our setup. So we go back to our plan A or, or our, our looking at the whole team and we say, okay, what's, what does our alignment look like? Is everyone moving left? Is everyone in a strong position where they can put their head, shoulders, spine, hips and feet in a good position? Um, what does our bonding look like between teammates? Um, and again, what does our stability look like um, through bind and through set? And I mentioned briefly that when we call bind, often the scrum moves up a little bit and then back down. If we wait for that scrum to settle and go down again, we, we have better uh, chance of success. And I'll just show you quickly what that looks like um, in terms of a timing. I had some audio to this one. So we noticed we heard the bind call. Scrum moves up a little bit. Players adjust their feet. Scrum settles back down. Set call comes in. And that allows for a moment of stability, a strike, and the ball being available. So we can play rugby once again. So often from a referee point of view, that's that's the number one way we can have an impact on improving stability is that uh, that timing piece. So again, going back to our basics, is our is my alignment good? Uh, is, is my binding looking okay before crouch and after bind? And is the timing of my bind and set calls uh, conducive to the success of the players. Um, often if it's too quick, players are still adjusting their feet when the ball's going in and that leads to big problems because if players are adjusting their feet and then the ball comes in, you're, you're drawing the player's attention to the ground and often when players' attention's on the ground, they're going to end up on the ground. The use of the reset, so when we do reset a scrum, we're not just resetting the scrum in hopes that the scrum is going to be successful on the second go. Um, we have to ask ourselves a question. Are we identifying one clear issue? And the reason I say one clear issue is there are often many um, small things that can that can occur in a scrum, but if we can at least commit to dealing with one issue at a time, we are in fact raising our chances of being successful in the second go rather than being you know jack of all trades master of none because if we if we start saying a bunch of things to front row forwards who, who have been working hard all game our chances of that message uh, being received uh, are quite minimal so uh, secondly are we communicating the issue and possible remedy to the players and when we say remedy you know we we can adjust the can you move your feet up can you bind higher on the back? Can you keep your elbow up? Can you keep your chest up so that your shoulders are above your hips? Um, if it's very slippery, can we adjust, Can we increase the height of the scrum? We're not able to maintain that height. Um, this is. These are examples of remedies that we can provide to the players to identify one clear issue um, that we see with uh, stability at the setup. Um, and again, are we getting success? So. How, whether or not your scrums are successful, that's dictated by is the ball coming out safely. And when I mean safely, um, there's no illegal pressure. Um, there's the scrums are not repeatedly collapsing when the ball's coming out. And the team that's able to uh, push forward is either the one applying pressure um, or getting good ball.
And again, throughout a game, um, we can check in with ourselves and are we getting success um, or are we just resetting and hope? If we're not getting success and we've tried to apply remedies, uh, we move on to, to a third step, which is you know, the use of free kicks and penalty kicks. Uh, free kicks and penalty kicks must use to follow up on issues that are not being resolved. Um, bearing in mind, and I put an asterisk there, if we see a very clear you know, multiple steps or early drive before the ball comes in, um, we don't necessarily have to reset and, and provide a remedy. Um, a remedy is usually to, to both teams or to two players, um, especially, you know, a tight head prop and a loose head prop. If we're providing a remedy to one team, that means what we're, we're telling the players is that there's been an infringement and we haven't sanctioned it. If one team is clearly a problem um, at setup, they're driving early or they've set up on an angle, and you and you've taken away other factors like the ground or um, um, or the other team, then you have to follow up with with a decision, whether a free kick or a penalty kick. So again, not chasing issues, but again, if we see we go back to the old clear and obvious, if we see a clear and obvious um, early push, um, change of angle, um, or uh, poor or weak bind resulting in in a collapse scrum, we we have to make a decision to follow up on that. And again, are we following up on expectations set earlier in the game? Um, you know, I'm not a fan of, of, of lengthy front row briefings, but if we do set the expectation that we expect, um, you know, strong, comfortable body positions before the ball's coming in, and we expect go forward before the scrum um, turns or collapses, and we're not achieving that, um, we can follow up with, with penalty kicks and free kicks if we're having that um, indication of non-success, which is we're not getting clean ball or we're not uh, getting good stability before the ball comes in. So just before we get to uh, notes for the, uh, notes of the coaches of match officials, which Nathan will take us through. Um, Nathan, are there any clips or pictures you want to go over? Uh, no. I think... Uh... There's been a lot of content. What I'm going to do is uh, wrap up what we've got and then see if we have time for a few questions. And then I think we'll be good. Um, the only thing I will say about the, the looking at the pictures piece is a couple of things. One is the most important part of uh, knowing and understanding how to manage and referee the scrum is to understand what it feels like sometimes. So uh, when we get into some of these notes for coaches and match officials, what we'll do is look at some options for helping referees get a better understanding of, of what the rules are and how to feel what that's all about. Um, and the second thing is that those those positions and, and positive body pictures that we saw are relevant at all levels of the game. So uh, although the clips are mostly of senior competitions, um, the same pictures of strong pushing positions and good body shape are what we want to see at all levels because that's the safest way for um, players to be positioned in a scrum. Okay. Um, notes for CMOs. So a couple of things. The first thing is always to go back to the referee's pre-match plan. So just take a look at whether or not within what referees have identified as areas for improvement, if they've, if they've um, uh, had anything around the scrum they feel they need to improve. Uh, next point there, Chris. The other point here is have they outlined how they're going to set themselves up for success? So when we look at the match official uh, profile, some of the things we see from a technical perspective would be, um, you know, seeing good shape at the scrum by or positive body positions by players at the scrum. Okay, well, one of the things we went over when we looked at how to go about planning for a match is what does it mean to, to prepare in some areas? Um, it's not enough to say, I'd like to improve this. <laughs> we need to have a, a how. And hopefully what we've done is presented um, the how we want to set up the scrum to help us achieve these things. So the CMO, um, if they're not noticing that uh, there's a clear outline of the process the referee will use in setting up the scrum, that's probably the best place to start. Um, the next one is obviously what are the what are the pictures that the referee is seeing and are they accurate? Do they have an understanding of what players are trying to achieve or are we awarding the 
the non-dominant team or the team that might be perceived to be offending as opposed to having earned the right to the ball. So um, the next point there, Chris, goes back to what I was saying earlier. I firmly believe that the best way for us as individuals is to learn what it feels like to be in a scrum. And I don't mean I want referees to go to training sessions and start um, <laughs> trying to get into senior level scrums in 3v3 contested formats. What I'm saying is um, it's good to just get into a position where we're able to just have a loose bind with some opposition, see what it feels like to have a player put some pressure on one side of your body or another. What does it feel like to be in a good strong position? What does it feel like to have your hips above your shoulders as you start to slouch and get tired? And 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 what does that look like to us then? You know, and so um, relating what we need to referee to what players and coaches are trying to do is critical, especially in an area of the game where the majority of referees have not played. So it's an important part of how we can learn um, to manage a scrum. And finally, obviously, has the referee or can the referee use the basics outlined throughout this presentation to offer remedies to the players? So what we did was we started with um, what the setup needs to look like and how referees can, can help the scrum be prepared to be successful. Um, then we looked at, okay, well, how um, do the physics kind of dictate if we do these things correctly, we get dom we get uh, rewarded, sorry, for dominance, excellent. And then when we don't um, play by the laws of the game and we need to make some, um, come up with some sanctions in order to ensure we have safer and more stable scrums, does the referee use those progressions at their disposal, whether it be through resets, and then eventually through sanctioning. So those are the biggest things, right? And, and finally, if we do all that and we still don't have positive outcomes, is the referee, again, like I said, using progressive sanctions um, based on what they established as the standards they expect to see at the scrum? And again, that includes all levels of the game. Um, and then just to wrap up, um, player welfare, as we know, is, is a high priority. We discussed a lot of it from a safety perspective at the scrum, but I just want to reiterate when we go out every weekend, uh, we do have to have a zero tolerance approach to foul play. Just a quick reminder of some of those resources that are still available, our uh, Rugby Canada Law Implementations Guide on the Rugby Canada YouTube channel, which will have the same, um, which will be the same site for these webinars. And then of course, the World Rugby Laws of the Game. Uh, we have a couple of minutes before the hour is up. We will um, wait patiently for two more minutes, but I, in the meantime, do want to say a massive thank you to Chris Asmus, who put a lot of time and effort into helping prepare this. We had a couple of calls um, and put together some of the content. So, Chris, thank you very much for your time uh, tonight. Okay. Doesn't appear as though anyone has any questions. I think we had quite a bit of content. It's similar to our tackle ruck, where we probably had to split that one into two, learning for uh, next year and when we roll these out in the new year uh, with some different topics. Um, oh, we do have one question. Nope, it's a thanks. Perfect, thanks, Cole. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there. I wanna thank everyone for their time. Thanks again to Chris. And uh, tomorrow we will do this again en français. Have a good night, everybody.